and welcome. This is NTA Tuesday Live, and I'm Cyril Stover. Nigeria came under several sectorial pressures in the year 2021. First was the carryover of the 2019-2020 COVID-19 impact. Then came the economic recession, which was surmounted, and the continued battle against insecurity occasioned by the activities of insurgents and bandits ravaging parts of the northeast and northwest regions of the country, while the southeast and southwest experienced violent attacks against federal agencies and assassinations carried out by outlawed groups. And all these trials came within the year under review. Yet, Nigeria still stands. Tonight, NTA Tuesday Live will focus on 2021 in retrospect and uh, the projections into 2022. But before we go into the discussion, let's get to see this report by Adibola Brookslin. Nigerians, like in many other countries, entered 2021 after surviving a year of an unusual health challenge occasioned by COVID-19 pandemic that is still posing threats to the world with different variants despite the discovery of vaccines. Leading by example, President Buhari received the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine out of the 3.2 million doses provided under the United Nations COVAX program. Other members of the Federal Executive Council followed and Nigerians in general. Vaccine offers hope for a safe country. In January 2021, President Muhammadu Buhari made top military shake-up. We are mindful of um, the demands and we can only at this stage pledge to do the utmost best. The year under review witnessed scores of kidnapping in parts of the country. It was a dark time for the nation's security architecture when Nigeria's army chief, Atahiru, and 11 other top military officials died in a plane crash. Year 2021 witnessed 15 jailbreaks. Over 5,000 inmates were freed in some major correctional centers across the country. From Lagos to Bini, Oshobo to Jos, Delta, Kano, Bauchi, Kogi, and all your states were also affected. Out of these, eight were successful. For the development of the oil and gas sector, President Buhari signed the Petroleum Industry Act into law in the month of August for the better deregulation of the sector. And on the economic front, President Buhari signed the medium-term expenditure framework, MTEF. That is it. That is it. <laughs> the Central Bank of Nigeria launched e-Naira, the country's digital currency, and the country's GDP also increased while there was a fall in the inflation rates. Today, I am mindful. But more still needs to be done. While Nigerian Akiwumi Adeshina was elected as the president of the African Development Bank for the second term in office. So decided. Another major event was the commitment made by President Buhari at the World Leaders Summit of the United Nations Climate Change Conference. COP26 in Glasgow, where Nigeria promised to cut its carbon emission to net zero by 2060. We must create inclusive and gender sensitive policies that address all issues connected to climate action for mitigation. The year witnessed some building collapse in Lagos among which was a 21-story building under construction which claimed several lives. The presentation of the amended Electoral Act to President Buhari and the defection of politicians from one party to another in preparation for 2023 elections as well as Anambra governorship election were the political events witnessed in 2021. Adebola, Brooklyn. All right, that report sets the tone for tonight's discussion. Let's start off by introducing our guests. We'd like to welcome to this program 
Major General Garba Wahab. He is Director General of the Army Resource Center. Abuja, thanks for being here with us. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, we are also joined tonight by Ajuri Ingelale, Senior Special Assistant to the President on Public Affairs. Ajuri, it's good to see you. Privilege to be with you, Cyril. Thank you very much. And we are also joined tonight by Professor Ken Ife, a development economist. Prof, thanks for joining us tonight. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. And also joining us tonight from our Kaduna Network Center is Professor Kabir Matu, a political scientist and a public affairs commentator. Uh, Prof, good to see you. Cyril, compliments of the season. Well, as we always do every Tuesday, we acquaint you with the procedures of this program. At the appropriate time, you can get to be part of the discussion in the studio. We will remind you when the time comes. And uh, let's just quickly say here that when that time comes, do us a favor, remember to turn down the volume of your TV set so we can avoid the hurlback and the echo. And we we'll always encourage people to go straight to the point. But that's when the lines will be open and when you can get to be part of the discussion. But for now, let's start off. As so much happened, and uh, 2021 is uh, just about rounding up now, and uh, we're looking at the many, 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 many issues of the year 2021, from the economy to security and so many others. But it would seem as if Security was one dominant, dominant factor throughout the year 2021. So let's begin to look at these issues that, that took center stage. And uh, General Wahab, from the point of view of many Nigerians, it would seem that um, the most talked about issue was security to lives and property. Yeah. How do you rate 2021? Uh, thank you very much. 2021 is tough, not only for Nigeria, but for, for the entire world. Because we are within ours, we look at it as if we are the only one facing it. But unfortunately, the management is what matters. We've not been able to manage it very well. The management could be notched a little bit up. And uh, because security is everybody's responsibility. And we used to say something in my center, we can only secure you through you. The average Nigerian must be involved in the security architecture of Nigeria. But the tendency is to leave it to only the security agencies, the military and the other uh, agencies. It is not. And a lot of meetings, a lot of conferences, a lot of seminars have been held. But the most important thing is, yes, we realize there's a problem. And that's the starting point. If people say there are no problems, then a lot of people will have been worried. Mm -hmm. But we all agreed there are issues on security, and everybody must put their hands on deck. Because without security, there can be development. The two goes on in hand. All right, we'll go into greater detail as we go on. But let's come to Professor Ken Ife, the economist. And uh, yes, the next thing we'd uh, talk about is um, how was the economy in 2021? Um, would you have a larger number of Nigerians say, well, 2021, uh, we can look back and say, not too bad. Or do we have people who say, look, <laughs> the economy has been biting and biting. Prof, what do you say? 2021 was a year of great escape from the the recession, the special type of recession caused by inflation that Nigeria entered into last year. And, and, and what is particular about this 2021 in relation to that is that we have three existential problems, challenges facing our country. One, of course, is the pervasive insecurity, which you know is asymmetric across the six geopolitical zones. And do nothing is not an option. Otherwise, we will be overrun like Afghanistan. We had the second one, which was COVID, that was life-threatening. And uh, the old, you know, do nothing means more debt, and nobody wants that. And then, of course, there's a third one, which is the level of unemployment and associated poverty. 
and the government is not doing is, is can't accept do nothing as an option and so the consequence of these three is that government has to look for resources and the resources have to be found you can't be worshiping money when you are facing existential problems but that was how we, we found ourselves the problem is not going to end the borrowing will continue but the thing is that all of these circumstances formed the basis for a new development plan that we, we've, we've just launched. And that plan is tougher, stronger, better placed to deal with the challenges of the future than all the past plans that I have seen in, uh, in living memory. So I believe we have more to talk about those. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. But I'll tell you what we'll do next. Let's go over to Kaduna and talk to Professor Kabir Matu and say, on the political front, how did we fare? Thank you very much, Cyril. I, I, th I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a mixed grill. Mixed grill in the sense that uh, 2021, uh, actually and practically is uh, apparently the last year for uh, this administration. Uh, we expect that by 2022 a lot of politicking will overshadow uh, you know, the affairs of governors because of rundown to the elections in 2023. So the political dimension here, apart from the, you know, Anambra election, we also have the you know, the, the permutations of the PDP by selecting their new national leadership, you know, uh, the national leadership has made it abundantly clear that it is ready to wrest power from the incumbents. That's a fundamental also benchmark in the year 2021. But I think the year is being capped up by the uh, Electoral Act controversy. The Electoral Act controversy here, meaning that the National Assembly, in its desperate attempt to continue to uh, retain their positions as members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, will try to create a lot of you know, difficulties for the uh, executive arm of government, especially at the level of state, to have a very serious, meaningful impact uh, you know, in who goes back to Abuja into the two chambers of the two National Assembly. And that's, in my view, what informed the decision of the Senate and the House of Representatives to agree uh, that in 2023 we shall have uh, you know, direct primaries embodied in the electoral laws. And I, I want to think uh, that one of the greatest political moves that the president has taken was, was holding accent to that particular piece of legislation. And the reason is simple, because in the present circumstance, it's pretty difficult and impossible for any political party to successfully conduct free and fair, credible party primary elections. It's not cost effective, it's not politically effective, it's therefore, in my view, uh, you know, a desperate attempt again by the legislature in the pursuit of their personal individual political ambitions, you know, to, to dramatically, uh, you know, bring down yeah, the right of the Nigerian people to freely select who are within their political formations to contest in an election uh, for representation. Uh, I, I think also it, it, it reduces and diminishes immensely the capacity of the political parties to you know, take decisions that uh, suits their political configurations and you know, peculiarities much better than this you know, military straight jacket approach which the National Assembly desires that it be done. So I see the, the withholding of accent as, as a way of you know, exercising the free will you know, of the democratic cultures in order for Nigerians uh, you know, uh, to be able to get to that level where we will be proud of you know, the kind of system, the kind of election, and the kind of governance that emerged. So I, I think 2021, uh, like I said, is a watershed. In 2022, Obviously, much of it is going to be politicking, politicking, and politicking, especially now that the APC federal government is finishing its second and final term. Uh, you know, the uh, opposition party has seen a lot of, you know, uh, opportunities. It's, it's usual when you sit in the opposition, uh, you know, as Professor Gambari was, will always say, 
the view of the road will always change as you move from the passenger seat to the driver's seat. You were driving, but now you are a passenger. So what you are seeing, obviously, is far, far, you know, uh, you know different from what the driver... We, we, we will go into this in greater detail. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll explore so many of the things you have contributed here in greater detail to um, uh, weigh them against what the other discussants and perhaps those who join in this discussion would feel about them. But for now, let's go to Ajuri Ngilali. And, um, uh, you know, it, it was deliberate for us to hear the views of other discussants and then come to Ajuri, who's Senior Special Assistant to the President on Public Affairs. Now, Ajuri, 2021 can be described as a difficult year for this administration, can't it? I think we're less concerned about the notion of uh, difficulty for the administration and more concerned about the notion of difficulty for the nation uh, because ultimately our people uh, elected uh, this administration uh, to deal with the multifarious challenges we face. The question is are we making progress on all fronts uh, and I think that there is absolutely no doubt uh, based on empirical evidence that indeed we are. Let me be very clear about what I mean. Uh, you've asked each of the uh, panelists about, respectively, about the economy, about security, and about politics. So I'm just going to touch a little bit of each before we go deeper into the program. Let's start with uh, core politics. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's a surprise to Nigerians uh, that we have seen over the course of the last, uh, give or take, 13 months, uh, three governors of uh, the People's Democratic Party defect to the All Progressives Congress. We have seen, uh, against the three coming to APC, we have seen exactly zero uh, APC governors going to the People's Democratic Party. It has been a one-way uh, one uh, traffic when it comes to high-level political defections. That is not even to start talking about what has happened in the National Assembly, uh, where there has been more one-way traffic from the People's Democratic Party to the APC. I believe that has to do with the, the realization and the pragmatic calculation uh, by many politicians in the country uh, that the record of previous administrations simply will not be able to stand up with what President Mohamedou Buhari has been able to achieve, and certainly that will be more so by the time he finishes his eight years in office uh, by May 2023. That's on the political front. On the security front, uh, we have not been fair about the fact that two of the major forces uh, of, 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 of security threat against our nation uh, have been decimated and have been taken off of the field this year. Uh, under the leadership of our Commander-in-Chief, President Mohamedou Buhari. Uh, of course, I refer uh, to Abubakar Shekau, uh, who, of course, is no more. I refer also to uh, Abu Musab al-Barnawi, who, of course, is no more. Uh, these were two major threats uh, for years. Uh, they have now been decimated. That has to do with the active efforts of our gallant forces uh, risking their lives to protect all of us every day. Uh, that is just one part of it. Uh, we have seen an unprecedented set of uh, platforms coming into the country uh, from the United States, from China, uh, from, uh, from, from Russia, uh, from Turkey, and from many other countries uh, that have really elevated our capacity to deal with the threats that we face. In addition to all of that, uh, we have obviously uh, been able to see uh, some level of stabilization. If you refer to uh, last year, early, let's say late 2020, and you recall what was going on uh, in the Southwest, particularly with some of the clashes and some of the violent conflict that was taking place there, we have seen relative uh, normalcy uh, restored uh, across the Southwest. Uh, I don't think that that is uh, detached from uh, the, the, uh, the, the current detainment of uh, one of the leaders uh, of a separatist movement that had been uh, fueling some of those issues. Uh, and again, of course, uh, the leader of the I indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB, uh, has been uh, detained and arrested. Uh, that has been something that uh, to quite a significant degree has led to a reduction in the kinds of uh, violent 
uh, incidents as we were seeing in the southeast geopolitical zone of the nation. So that's security, and there's much more I can get into on that. Let's just quickly, very quickly look at economy, where you have the return from the recession. We had moved from negative growth to over 5% growth in 2021 as a result of the implementation of the Nigeria Economic Sustainability Plan, saving 2.4 million jobs across the nation uh, by giving payroll support to MSMEs across the country, uh, by uh, constructing uh, 500 kilometers of rural roads linking farms to markets, uh, by putting 774,000 young people to work uh, over the, over a three-month period, uh, reconstructing roads uh, and sanitizing uh, local governments across the federation. These are the measures put in place by President Mohamedou Buhari's administration across sectors uh, to ensure that we have now uh, stabilized and we are now in a position uh, to build and expand uh, the growth we've been able to record this year. Yeah. Right. So. Um uh, you have a long list there of um, so many things, and uh, my saying that it was a tough year for the administration was mainly because um, uh, some of the issues that we have looked at, um, you know, uh, on the edge, were matters that were hotly debated in the public space, and uh, particularly the question of uh, security, where so many Nigerians felt that uh, it would seem as if all attempts to find a lasting solution to the security threat to lives and property um, has not been working so far, even though administration officials have a different view. So let me put this to a General Wahab here. There's a feeling among some Nigerians that for once the Nigerian military that was seen as um, one of the best in the world, it would seem as if uh, it's overwhelmed by uh, the activities in the northeast and other parts of the country. Now you've even heard them spread out so thin that traditional um, uh, duties uh, by uh, civil forces have also been taken over by the military. Uh, you see, the, 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 the issue here is we concentrate more on the kinetic approach to solving our problem. The military, the military and security elements. Leaving a little bit of the civil component out. Now the, 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 the issue is we are attempting a whole of government, initially a whole of government approach. Now the issue is a whole of societal approach. You cannot keep on engaging the military every time, all the time because the causes of the crisis of the issues must be addressed while the military is expected to provide the enabling environment for people to discuss, for people to dialogue. Even in food war, you fight a war for politicians to go back onto the drawing table to, to judge or to talk among themselves. So we must find a way of getting virtually all Nigerians to be a part of the security architecture. In this part of the world, if something happens, People are very reluctant in providing information and providing intelligence. You may have the best of platforms. Yes, all the platforms are coming in. The resources are coming in. But you need intelligence. You need information. And you can only get that from the civil society, from the average Nigerian to be part of the, of the total security architecture. And that is one thing that is, must be fully coordinated. It is there, but the coordination is not fully effective. If you get everybody to be a part of the architecture, it's going to be fantastic. And that's why I said the management is what matters. We, we, we are using the, the top party approach, two, two, mani two, two styles of management. Everybody doing their job, everybody doing their beats. And so you don't have to call the military every time. They are not trained for policing job. They are doing policing job. There will be issues. And that's why everybody, every time people keep on complaining about human rights issues. Because the military man is not trained fully. It is now we are looking at those things that we're training them on human rights issues. The man faces his opponent, his opposition, the adversary, and everything. People will still complain. Because now what we're doing is, like Robert Smith said, we're facing Nigerians. Who are the targets? Who are the objects? And where the opposition? So you must be very, very careful. So it's a different ball game altogether. Now the enemy, uh, 
you know, can be described as um, fellow citizens, yes, right? Yes, fellow citizens. So you must be very careful in the way you deal with him. And that is one thing that the military is very, very careful about. So that the, the, the cry of, hey, you are abusing human rights, does not come in. It has reduced so much because so much training is going on that. Okay, uh, uh, let's get back to the economist, uh, Professor uh, Kenifi. Uh, the thinking is, which does more harm to the people? Um, yes, COVID-19 came and wreaked havoc the whole world over, and Nigeria suffered just like all other countries of the world. But then people say, well, is it the security matters that have now prevented the economy from growing the way it should grow. I mean, if you talk about food security, for instance, a whole lot of people will tell you, well, how many farmers in those affected areas can go to their farms? We've also heard reports of um, uh, uh, bandits or terrorists, as we now call them, who have prevented people from harvesting their crops or who have forced farmers to pay for them to reap their crops. So which one, which do you face? If you can't guarantee the security of lives and property, can you really grow the economy that way? Actually, because um, security is number one challenge. And this is because insecurity drives investors out of your country. It discourages investors that want to invest in your country. It also discourages the domestic investors that want to expand to other parts of the country. So insecurity is so pervasive that it does affect all facets. Now let's take, it, take the food that you mentioned. What has happened with the insecurity is that it's in the six geopolitical zones and it has shrinked our agroecological footprint. It's not irretrievable because we are fighting it. We are using technology to fight it, end-to-end -end intervention. We are having mechanization of our agricultural system in the smaller footprint. We are also using hybrid, uh, uh, hybrid seeds and you know, high resi disease resistant and high yield varieties, bringing in specialized uh, inputs that are well designed for the particular location. So all of that, organic fertilizer, herbicides, insecticides, uh, NPK, and all of that are all brought to bear. And even the organization of the agri, agri production system has actually changed to be able to reflect, heavily modernized, with 4.8 million, uh, 4 million farmers accessing resources without collateral and then doing well over 5 million hectares. It's an incredible feat that is just a response to the security challenge. And also, you know that that security is only one part of the challenge. There's a, a bigger challenge that our population is growing at about 3% a year, and, uh, and then the urbanization is growing at 4.66%. percent This time, it, by 2030, 70% of our population will be in the urban area, leaving only 25%. So you're going to tell me who's going to grow the food when most of the farmers, the average age of the farmer is over 65 years old. So it's very, very critical that we know and recognize that what is going on now is intended to address squarely the level of the challenges that we are facing. So insecurity is number one. The impact of it on food is very important. And in fact, where you see that evidence is in inflation. If you look at inflation, the persistence of inflation, if you look at the five components of inflation, uh, uh, CPI, which is the property price, the headline inflation, then you have the core inflation, which excludes food, and then you have the food sub basket, you have urban and rural inflation. Now, there's a big gap that has persisted over three years. That gap is about 5% between the, the food sub index and the, core inf and the red line inflation. And it's about 8% to 10% between that food and the um, uh, core inflation. So what then happens is that over in the last two, three months, it has narrowed down to about less than 2% uh, headroom and then less than 4% between the, so it's narrowing down to less than half. Now that is what is driving the reduction in inflation. Even though the other components are still showing a rise on a month-by-month -month basis, but the food is dragging the inflation down. 
So there is, there is less, um, there's more reduction in food sub-basket than the increase in the other sub-indices. So that is what is uh, actually going on. So, but it's good because if you look at our plan, development plan, we are projecting 10%. Even some projections from uh, IMF and uh, Moody's are saying 9% inflation by 2024, which will be good news because that will now come close to the target of, um, that's the CBN target of 5 to 9% inflation figure. So all of these are saying, uh, what you are supporting what you have just said, that this security is pervasive, is affecting all of that, and many of macroeconomic indicators are affected one way or the other by the level of insecurity. All right. Uh, we've got a number of reports, and uh, we'll begin to take them now. Let's get to see this one, uh, starting off with uh, one from Lagos. Lagos State, best by being the epicenter of COVID-19 pandemic, has contributed immensely to Nigeria, being ranked by the World Health Organization as the fourth best in terms of curtailing the spread of the virus. Beyond this, the state, through support from the federal government, thrived in year 2021 in various sectors such as rail and road infrastructure, and which includes the completion of Lagos Ibadan Standard Gauge Rail. The state also made significant achievements in areas of education, agriculture, among others. Nigeria had a, a strong 21, a resilient 21. I mean, strict economic terms, of course, we haven't seen a kind of dip in economic activity that we've seen in other places. But more importantly, I think things are moving along in a positive direction in the country. So let me just cite a few of these uh, positive developments. I mean, the movement towards having uh, state-directed economic development is now unstoppable. We need to ensure that we have a lot more predictability, a lot more stability, uh, in the, our macroeconomic environment, particularly around inflation and around the, the foreign exchange market, because those things are critical to ensuring that you have confidence. Experts believe that Nigeria has a diversified economy, but need to deepen efforts and policy drive in building up critical sectors for economic buoyancy. Whatever we can export now, from flowers to product, uh, manufacturing to to commodities, to technologies, anything we can ex export, services, entertainment, footballers, anything we can export to end foreign currency is going to be very significant. It's resuscitate all the primary health care centers in all the local government areas. And you give basic help to people because it is people at the lower echelon of society that actually drive the economy. With a 4.3% GDP growth in third quarter of 2021, Experts give credence to the revitalization of sectors earlier shut down due to COVID-19 pandemic. In Lagos, Amaka Owo. All right, from Lagos, we go up to Kenu and take this report. It's a commercial hub, not only in Nigeria, but Sub-Saharan Africa, Efficient passenger and freight transportation is an essential need of the people of Kanu. The groundbreaking ceremony in July this year of the Kanu Kaduna Standard Gauge Rail Project by President Muhammadu Buhari is the most important event that gladdened the hearts of residents of the business oriented state. The 203 kilometer rail line is part of the Lagos Kadu Rail Modernization Project of the federal government. This administration recognizes rail transportation as an important economic driver and as such has accorded railway infrastructure development the greatest priority it deserves. When actualized, it will connect with the Abuja Kaduna corridor, thereby linking the northern commercial hub with the nation's capital. The biggest station in Nigeria will be cited here. And it is cited here because it will connect Kandu Maradi. The government and people of Kano are pleased that the project will ease transportation of passengers and goods, thereby stimulating accelerated economic growth. This significant infrastructure project is a clear indication to the Buhari-led administration commitment to promoting trade and commerce, as well as creating great employment opportunities among our team youth in Nigeria. 
Ahead of the commencement of work on the mega rail project, Kano State Government has already committed more than 2 billion naira in the provision of the needed infrastructure to facilitate the takeoff of the Dala Inland Dry Port to be connected with the proposed mega rail station. Critical components of the work on the two economically significant projects are expected to be actualized in the incoming year. For the people of Kano, therefore, 2022 will be a year of economic transformation. All right, um, having seen those two reports, um, uh, let us quickly go back to our Kaduna studio and uh, um, link up again with uh, Professor Kabir Matu. Well, Prof, from your initial comments um, when we started off, uh, you obviously looked at um, the last lap of uh, the activities of the legislature at the national level. And uh, obvious from your comments, you weren't pleased with um, matters dealing with uh, uh, the uh, electoral uh, bill. But beyond that, certainly the legislature, in consonance with the executive, provided the basis for some of the projects and policies that uh, could be said to have impacted the lives of Nigerians, either by way of uh, appropriation or environment or the making of appropriate laws. So if you look at the activities of the legislature in 2021, what else would you say? Thank you very much, Cyril. I, I think the legislature, has, you know, has done fantastically very well, uh, you know, throughout there. One of the uh, numerous achievements of this particular National Assembly is its timely passage of, you know, all appropriation bills before it. Uh, this is a tremendous achievement. It has not been recorded in the uh, first 16 years and even in the first four years of this administration. This is being achieved now. Uh, it means that, uh, you know, the National Assembly is playing uh, its most central and critical role, and that is that of, uh, you know, economic, uh, uh, you know, dimension of rulemaking, which is, uh, you know, like I said, central and, and fundamental to it. So, uh, on, on that count, fine. I know, even at the level of legislation and uh, the way that they have responded to uh, both, uh, you know, emerging national issues and conventional realities, you know, has been so, so fantastic. One, one of the things that, you know, the critics of the day would like to always uh, bring forward uh, is, uh, you know, the idea that uh, too much concurrence between the legislature and the executive gives them a sleepless night. Uh, but once that is done, you know, with the full uh, understanding of the basics of why there should be collaboration between the two arms of government, I think that's fine for democracy, uh, even if it does not suit, you know, uh, the bellies of certain uh, uh, political areas. So, uh, that the National Assembly has done very well, and I expect that it's also going to do very well. I, my, my position about the uh, amendment or the insertion of direct party primaries uh, the Electoral Act, which was vetoed by the, I mean, which was here, uh, whose uh, accent was uh, withheld by the president, uh, has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, I, I, I have been with the National Assembly very closely. I've been their consultant from 2003 up till now. Uh, so I, I have, you know, an, a very important insight into it. But, but, but the way to solve the problems of, uh, you know, uh, powers of executives, especially at state level, within the Nigerian Federation, I think will better be addressed uh, through compromise rather than, uh, you know, confrontation. Uh, it is very clear in every federal system, the theory is there very, you know, for you to see in every federal system, the constituent units apparently are stronger when they combine their forces together than even the center, because the center is comprised of the comp you know, constituent units. And the, the, the legislature, as it is, you know, will always have to respond. And that's why, you know, since 1999, if you recall, there has been growing agitation on the part of the political class, especially within the legislature and those who wants to be or who are governors of their respective states in uh, you know, trying to forge ahead this, uh, you know, very unfortunate conflict, which I think uh, is unnecessary. 
between the legislature and the executive, it's supposed to be an effective collaboration and understanding for the good of the generality of the population and not, uh, you know, how to, yes, governors are, are, are very strong. They de de decide, uh, especially through the delegate system, who, who gets what, when, and how. Uh, you know, the, 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 that's fine. And I, I, I think my, my final call here is that uh, the, the, the legislature has done fantastically very well, like I said, in 2021. And uh, we hope they will also do better, uh, you know, in 2022, being their uh, uh, politically active, you know, yeah, in, 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 in the present circumstances, uh, so that we can have, uh, you know, uh, a greater understanding. But I call on the members of the National Assembly not to try to override that view too, uh, because of the very cumbersome economic, uh, economic, political, and even social implications uh, in case the law uh, makes it mandatory that every political party should uh, do its primaries through the direct means. I, I think that's an infringement also, like I did say, uh, on the fundamental uh, human rights over the mental objectives, uh, the freedom that these political associations themselves uh, are supposed to enjoy. So let's respect, uh, you know, our territorialities. Let's also try to plan our political ambitions uh, on the basis uh, of how much we are able to build synergies, to build, you know, friendship and camaraderie between uh, various levels of governments uh, and members, you know, consisting of this, uh, rather than, you know, this knife and dagger approach. Uh, that is always being presented as a way, uh, you know, of solving simple political issues uh, that can be resolved uh, through consistent dialoguing uh, that will lead to the understanding between the, the various parties. So I, I think the parliament is my constituency. I've been a student of uh, parliament since the return to civil rule in 1999. We've tried to study, we've tried to you know, aggregate a lot of data and even build capacities of parliamentarians uh, and the staff of the, uh, you know, uh, various parliaments uh, over this long period of time. So I, I, I think they have done very well, and I'll encourage them also to continue to do well. Okay. Well, um, taking it a little bit further, um, if we turn to Ajuri Ngilali, the question of um, consensus building, collaboration, um, um, you might, to some extent, be a little bit uh, skeptical about it for one reason. Would you say it's a fair comment that um, the executive in 2021 um, effectively had the legislature under its wings? That's one part of it. Uh, would that be a fair comment? Would it also be fair to say that... Um, the general public, the citizens, might not really think um, it's healthy to always be on the same side. How would you respond to that? Thank you very much once again, Cyril, uh, for the opportunity. I think let, let's just understand that we've unfortunately come to a place uh, where in our public discourse uh, and in our pol political culture uh, where it is fashionable uh, to disagree in the most obscene, uh, antagonistic, and cynical uh, manners possible. Uh, President Muhammadu Buhari uh, is a gentleman. He is a man of dignity, of decorum, of principle. And he does not conduct state policy uh, or intergovernmental uh, relationship on the basis of trying to score political points uh, according to a political culture that has become rotten over the last several decades. He's interested in reshaping the political culture uh, in such a manner that we reclaim the dignity uh, and sense of self-respect uh, that many of our leaders from the First Republic so cherished. Uh, and I think the idea, and I want to just say that by going into the relationship between the executive and the National Assembly. When, when, when we, I think the, the Eighth National Assembly uh, felt that it was in their uh, political self-interest or self-survival uh, to make everything a political gimmick. You had situations where uh, funds uh, uh, devoted to major projects were being diverted into billions of naira for tricycles and constituencies. Uh, you had 
uh, a whole bunch of situations where appointments were being stopped even though those agencies were being made comatose by the stoppage of those appointments just so that somebody who was a principal officer could eventually run for president. These are things that are not healthy for the nation. Uh, it might appeal to the political culture of today, but it's not healthy for the country. Now we have a ninth national assembly that is coming and has said, we have to actually work for the country now. We can't just work for ourselves now. We have to work with an elected president who was elected by the people of this country to deliver an agenda for the benefit of the people of this country and not for the benefit of principal officers. And so when they work together to achieve things like the passage of the Petroleum Industry Act, uh, things like the passage of successive uh, finance bills, things like uh, January to December uh, budgeting cycles as a result of the swift, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, ascent, uh, passage and ascent of successive appropriation bills uh, during the life of the Ninth Assembly. These are things that have actual tangible impact on the life of our citizens, and that's very important. Now, to the issue of whether or not they disagree enough, understand that we just were talking about the Electoral Act Amendment, right? The Joint uh, chambers of the, uh, of the National Assembly, the Senate and the House of Representatives, made a position known and passed a law that had a, a provision that dealt with direct primaries. Uh, the president made his position known uh, based on advice, uh, based on consultative, uh, you know, kind of exercises across various, uh, not just MDAs, but other agencies and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, tiers of government, branches of government, and said, look, based on this advice, this is the right thing to do. Now, that was at variance, obviously, with the position of the National Assembly. So clearly, there's no lack of areas of disagreement, but the manner in which disagreement is being handled now, see, is just a bit more decorous uh, than what the political culture is used to. And what we are saying is that we can disagree on issues without being disagreeable. We can be dignified in our disagreements, uh, and we can move the nation forward in a way that recognizes that whether you like APC or you like PDP, you're a Nigerian first, and Nigeria will outlive any of these political parties. We understand that, and hopefully, the political culture uh, will follow suit once President Muhammadu Buhari completes uh, his exercise of reshaping the political culture of the country. We'll look we'll at look um, other aspects of that in greater detail, but um, uh, General, we'll, we'll come back to you. And um, there's another aspect I want us to look at uh, beyond uh, what we see ordinarily as um, uh, security challenges. And Nigerians would ask, how well has this administration partnered with the international community in addressing some of these challenges? I mean, it was public uh, knowledge at some point in time uh, that um, not many uh, advanced countries were in a hurry to lend a hand uh, to help put down this uh, insurgency at some point in time. Has it been a little bit better? Did it get better in 2021? We see a bigger international uh, uh, interest and collaboration in putting down uh, the insecurity challenges in uh, the security challenges in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Uh, there have been massive improvement in the relationship uh, between Nigeria and the international community, particularly the Western world. Uh, you could take it from the issue of the Tucano. The, the Tucano aircraft was supposed to have been in our inventory since 2007, thereabouts. Uh, denied to Nigeria about 2013, 14, 15. But now it's coming. It's elements are coming. So which, which shows that there is a massive improvement. The president had gone out on the College of Diplomacy, meeting people and then really talking about what's, what's going on. So a lot of efforts have been in that way, and that's why things are beginning. Platforms are now being released to Nigeria, being sold to Nigeria, compared to uh, 2000, and even up to 2017. The Lehi Law, the Castra 2017, human rights issues, those things are gradually being put aside. And it is based on the effort of the president on one hand and the other elements, uh, the system opening up a little bit, the Americans and the Britons are virtually in my degree uh, with the theater command, looking at what is happening, advising 
providing elements of, of assistance, especially in, in intelligence. So when you look at all this, you realize that so much had gone in. Uh, with the, w my worry is with our immediate neighbors, hmm. uh, Chad, Niger, Cameroon, and Benin Republic, Francophone African countries. We need to do more with France because it is actually France that is our neighbor, uh, determining what happens in those countries. So we need to take our relationship with France a little bit higher. Uh, because if we do that, a lot of things will fall in place. And I'll give an example. You have Operation Bokane going on, and then the French were planning to start another operation within that operation while trying to withdraw from Mali. And then in the, in the Lake Chad area, you have an operation ongoing, and then you want to start another. And then you have the Sahel G5, most francophone. So Nigeria needs to be, if Nigeria is not going to be a member of the G5 Sahel, we should at least be on observer basis to know what is happening. And that's why I believe much more still needs to be done with France. But with the Americans, it's improving, at least for the, for the Secretary of Defense to come to Nigeria uh, in the shuffle, whatever, within three, uh, three African countries, and Nigeria was one of those he came to. And all of a sudden, uh, you could realize that things are beginning to move. Let's get back to the economy now. And um, uh, Professor Kenny Faye, 2021, so many things determined or, you know, impacted on the growth of the economy. I'd, I'd like to take a look at the growth of um, industries. Uh, for some time, we got reports of many industries folding up, some businesses moving to neighboring countries. But you see, one of the biggest issues here is the role of power in growing the economy and in businesses. 2021 witnessed a lot in terms of improving Nigeria's power generation and power supply. But then you could also say that within 2021 we've seen numerous failures, shutdowns, you know, um, breakdowns in the grid. Uh, shutdowns that happened almost four or five times with such frequency. How has that impacted on efforts to get industries up and running again? There's no doubt in anybody's mind <clears throat> that infrastructure deficit in the country has been an accumulation of neglect since 1960s. You know, the last time the rail track, new rail track was laid, was 1927. Then you look at the road, the stock of infrastructure in Nigeria is 35% of our GDP. South Africa is 80%. Many countries is over 100% of their GDP. That just, just gives you an idea of the scale of neglect of infrastructure. All the time, all the money that we had in the 80s and 90s, we are not going into building infrastructure. Let me tell you how important it is. Infrastructure is very important. If you look at the visions of Nigeria, for example, the 2030 vision says where GDP will be 1.64 trillion, and then 2050 will be 6.4 trillion, consistent with Africa, which will be 29 trillion. If we don't go to our 6.4 trillion, Africa will move to 29 trillion. They will go without Nigeria. So the fact is that the, for you to draw investment in, to, you need to build that kind of infrastructure to support that kind of growth. And that's why the government is borrowing. It's borrowing, and the law, FRA 2007, permits the government to borrow for capital expenditure and also for human resource development, which involves uh, health, education, and uh, capacity development, and also, of course, employment. Now, companies complain. I've seen surveys that say 65% of companies provide power for themselves 90% of the time. I've seen running analysis in a in, in website of MAN saying that 77% of the countries are complaining that their problem is, is power. We all know that. We know, and it's not just power, it's also transportation cost. Transportation cost can add as much as 20% to the input cost. Power can add as much as 30%. Those two alone, about 50%. So having, having said that, government is borrowing, and it has to borrow because we're not going to be looking at money 
um, and then forget the three existential problems that I have just mentioned, the challenges. But the borrowing has to be prudent. And I can tell you, we haven't exceeded our headrooms at all. I mean, the, I mean, World Bank says we could go to 50% of our GDP on our external borrowing, not domestic and external borrowing put together. And then the normal average will be about 40%. But we are not even there yet. But it's projected by, by 2024, we may well be heading to that 50%. But it is not, it's not the debt that we are owing that is important. What is important is that the revenue, we are, we are actually the lowest tax constituency in Africa. So on one hand, why is our revenue to government revenue to GDP is about 7%? The average across Africa is 18%. So it looks like we have to triple that, that revenue base. And I have to tell you that I have been to Senate Finance Committee. I can see the venom that they are pouring on MDAs, that, the agents that are not paying up and they're remitting their money. I have seen aggressive plan from Ministry of Finance to raise the money from 7% to 15%. You've all, everybody sees what PIA, eventually this PIA got, got signed. How many, over two decades, we've been politicizing with it. Today it got signed. And you can see the confidence with FIRA saying, we hope that our revenue will double next year to over 10 trillion. So the action to raise those revenues are robust. And they're all captured in the big plan, the, the medium term plan. And so given all that, you can see that the medium term plan also expects massive investment, 350, 348 trillion Naira investment between now and 2025 which means on average, every year we are going to be looking for 70 trillion. Now, the government is not going to say, I'm not even worried about the impact of election because government has willed this to the private sector. Because all, all, government, all government agencies together, all the gov levels of government are going to contribute about 50 trillion. Federal, less than 30, state, 14, local government, seven. So the only the, the, the 300 trillion is going to be going to the private sector to find. And they're not going to be, they're not wish, wishful thinking you know, on the budget. They are going to find it. You can see the, 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 the infrastructure company. It's got one trillion capitalization from federal government, and they are going out now to go and find another additional 14 trillion naira with which to now warehouse these federal government projects, national projects, and then take them and run with them. You've seen aggression on the, uh, the privatization program you see more monies are being expected to come. And everywhere you go, more trusts are going to be set up, more uh, uh, creative uh, first-class companies. I was in a committee that looked at Ministry of Finance Incorporated to restructure that to a world-class asset company so that we can begin to leverage our assets to improve liquidity because the whole challenge is liquidity. Saudi Arabia needed $25 billion. They didn't go to IMF or World Bank. They said, oh, wait a minute. Uh, we have Saudi Aramco. How much is it worth? They went and valued it. And found that it's over $1.5 trillion. I said, okay, give me 5% of that. And they got the money they needed. We need to be doing this because we have thousands of assets of government that are all there out, out to, be, uh, to the private sector to engage. So there's very creative, imaginative, action-oriented, and we're monitoring framework. Again, compare that to other plans. We have rigorous monitoring framework. Every sector, you could see the targets, the baseline, and what they're expected to get. And then, of course, once you have that, monitoring takes, uh, follows through. So it's going to get better. From what I've seen, it's going to get better. But the worst is not over yet. Okay. At this point, we'll take a short break. When we return, the phone lines will be open, and that means you can get to be part of the discussion of the studio. So stay with us at NTA Tuesday Live. We'll be back shortly. Oriented Innovation Talk Show. All right, thanks for staying with us. And um, this is that part of the program, as we said, 
uh, that you can now join in. The lines are going to be on your screens. You can take advantage of those lines and call in to air views on the subject matter. Remember, as we said at the start of the program, when if your call gets through to the studio, do us a favor, turn down the volume of your TV set to avoid the hurlback or the echo. And we always say this to you, don't worry about the greetings. A mere hello is enough. Just go straight to the point, keep it short, straight to the point, so others can also get on the platform and contribute. And whatever issues you raise, our panelists will be only too willing to respond to them. So here we go. We start off this segment uh, by taking yet another report, this time from Asaba. Delta State Government is focused on skills acquisition for its youths. This is through various programs and backed upon by the states. It is hoped that every youth in the state is technically inclined and self-reliant in no distant time. By 2022, what the state is doing now is making sure that the social register of the state captures all the excluded, all the excluded uh, uh, vulnerable families. And when you have them, in the social register owned by Delta State government. You find that intervention is very easy. Whether there are children out of school, like I said, whether there are young people with skills, but they don't have education, whether there are, they are, there are still young people with education, but without skills, they interact at every given point, whether there are persons living with disabilities, whether there are even children living with disabilities. On his part, the acting state director, National Orientation Agency, Chris Anyabwine, said, there is need for state and federal governments to do more in the coming year to tackle the issue of drug abuse and dependency among youth in the state, as these have resulted to other societal ills. It's been said that uh, drug is a trigger for most of the crime that we have. Some say almost 50% of crimes are triggered by drugs. However, not everybody agree that uh, all crimes are triggered by drugs because they are also caused by other things. And so we want to say that uh, looking forward, we will we'll be uh, wanting to see more rehabilitation centers for youths who are already hooked on drugs spread across the length and breadth of the country. Improved infrastructure developments to help boost commerce in the state will go a long way in checking idleness both among youths and other members of the society which in turn will mitigate crime. The government on its part has provided uh, platforms to support businesses even with COVID-19 reliefs and other measures to support the poor and vulnerable in society. They have various programs uh, such as the NSIP, National Social Investment Programs, uh, which they have rolled out. And in 2022, we want to have more youths come to take advantage of those facilities. A call is on for civil society organizations to collaborate with security agencies for a stronger strategy to fight insecurity come 2022. Onyinye Joshua Ifai. All right, and from Asaba, we take on this report from Orca. An important political landmark, the Anamba State 2021 governorship election has been conducted. The exercise was described by many as a litmus test for the electoral umpire, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and security agencies. This came on the heels of security threats, including the activities of unknown government and IPOP seat at home orders, which were at the peak in the state before the November 6, 2021 polls. The security challenges put the election under a huge cloud of doubt with great fear and apprehension among the citizenry. We had the elections and the elections came out quite surprisingly though because of the time that we are in, if you contextualize the environment, very successful. And we give God all the glory for also the outcome of the election the peace, the tranquility that followed the election. Uh, we described it as uh, 
one of the years uh, in this country, any survival, we have uh, a reason to say thank you, Jesus. However, IMEC proved its metal in technology application with the introduction of the biometric voter accreditation system device, the BIVAS, which permits easy collection and transmission of results. Economic downturn occasioned by high inflection rates, COVID-19 pandemic with the latest discovery of Omicron variant. We are among the headlines in the year 2021. Year forward in this country is ethical reorientation. First of all, the followers reorienting themselves, telling themselves that uh, we can survive, we can do it. You re evaluate yourself, self-assessment, where you are doing wrong, just get it right as a person. Every other thing will fall in line. The consensus is that the leaders and the led should work as a team to take the country to greater heights, as no one is an island in Oka, Chinyere, Fesi, Okoye. NTA News. Okay, it's an apt uh, place to take on the next uh, set of issues as we go to Kaduna and uh, link up with uh, Professor Kabiru Matu. 2021, leaving aside uh, the state, let's look at uh, the political class. 2021, we saw off-circle elections, as uh, they've come to be known now. Um, these are meant to, the latest, of course, was uh, seen as a litmus test of what is to come in 2023. Let's talk about the political class, how those elections played out, and what uh, 2021 saw generally from uh, the politicians themselves. Uh, th thank you, thank you very much, Cyril. But but I I, I think the, the the political class, you know, uh, as usual, is also apparently learning fast. Uh, it's not as uh, uh, you know uh, uncooked as it used to be in the past. Uh, there is some level of decency even in the uh, cutthroat competition, uh, you know, that uh, seems to be emerging in 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 2023. Uh, on a general note, I think the Nigerian political establishment seems to be learning fast uh, in the sense that there are certain uh, fundamental mistakes that one would call political blunders that used to happen. Uh, uh, you know, well, I still see uh, quite a little of it rearing its ugly head in, in the desperation for, uh, you know, criticizing uh, what is being done, at, uh, you know, in, in also uh, preparation uh, of a fertile ground for possibly, uh, you know, uh, having it uh, easy uh, in 2023. But I, I, I think on a general note, uh, like I said, the, the, the political class seems to be learning and we expect that they will learn more uh, going into 2022. Uh, one of the most tragic, uh, you know, scenarios of the Nigerian political uh, vocabulary uh, uh, has to do with this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, winner takes all uh, mentality thereby when once you are out, uh, you know, seeking for uh, acceptability in the part of the populace uh, so that you are elected into a, a particular level of political representation. Uh, you know, the, the decision of the, 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 the electorate is not often uh, respected by those who lose. Uh, this, this is very tragic. Uh, we have seen what is happening in advanced, uh, you know, uh, capitalist social formations, for instance, uh, where uh, as, 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 as heated as, you know, the electoral process uh, is, uh, as soon as, you know, the, the decision has been made by the uh, citizenry, uh, you know, th those who, who lose, uh, you know, eventually accept and uh, pledge to cooperate uh, in moving the society forward. So I think if politics really is an intercourse of seeking to partner with people in the service of God and humanity through 
the electoral process, I think we, our attitude to it should uh, be more democratic than it is now. Yes, let's be desperate uh, in searching for it, but let's not fabricate uh, mere political lies in order uh, to create bad impression on the face of the public of any person that is in political position or political authority. Uh, if you don't know when you do it today and you achieve your objectives by the time that you are there tomorrow and when it is done, uh, you know, to you, uh, you will feel the pinch very, very uh, painfully. So we need to do more. We have done very well. We need to improve on our attitudes and uh, continue to internalize the yes, very... Yes, Prof, we'll return to you in just a moment. I'd I just like to ask you to pause a while. Let's see if we can get in this call from uh, Abdul Rahim in Lokoja, and we'll return to you for the other aspect of uh, how the political class uh, conducted itself in 2021. Abdul Rahim from Lokoja, you're on. Go ahead. to uh, be uh, on the, the show this time around. And the first reaction I want to uh, put forward is that of, uh, you know, the statement Professor Matu made that uh, it was in desperation to go back to Abuja. The National Assembly brought out, uh, you know, the proposal for direct summary. I think I want to disagree with uh, his position. The issue of party primaries, you know, was as a result of, uh, you know, uh, public opinion that came. And uh, if our population is growing, the cost of uh, doing election will never go down. And I think that it is this, uh, you know, primaries that has to be, you know, conducted, especially using electronic form that will bring our cost of uh, election down. And I thought you would have said that what they needed to do is to cross the T's and dot the I's and take it back for Athens. So saying, uh, making such a statement, you know, at this time is not uh, too good. The other thing has to do with uh, security. Uh, there is something about our security that we've still not gotten right. And that is the punitive aspect, you know, of uh, people doing evil things. People are already aware in Nigeria that if you commit crime, there is a way out. And as long as that remains in our psyche, there is no way, you know, the security problems will abate. If you like, go and bring all the Tucanos in America. It will not abate. So we must have to look for a way, you know, to ensure that that, that is resolved. If anybody commits crime, the punishment should be stiff and it should be determined. There shouldn't be any, any, any way around it. That is my contribution. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Abdurrahim from Lokoja. Thank you. Now, let's keep the calls coming through. And uh, the issues you raise um, will be looked at in greater detail. Um, uh, just before we return to uh, Professor Kabir Batu, because um, uh, the last caller did not agree with his initial comments on uh, the question of um, the president withholding... Uh, Ascent to Electoral Act. He also spoke of something to do with uh, the security challenges, and that brings me to the question, even though he didn't quite say it, um, he says people should be punished when they have committed crimes. Now, we have insurgents, we have people who have come out to say they have repented, but Nigerians are still skeptical about those claims, and um, some have said you treat them with kid gloves. You say they, they claim they are, they, they are repentant, and then you provide them all the opportunities. What happens to the victims? Thank you very much. Don't, I want to take you back to what I said. Let us, we emphasize the kinetic approach, the military right. approach. Mm. We are talking about a whole of societal approach now. Mm. Let everybody do their job. I mentioned that. Mm. The judiciary 
must be up and doing, must perform. If the judiciary don't, you have, even while I was in service, over 3,000 Boko Haram members arrested, and the first 100 came out, and 99 were freed. The military became afraid. It means the battle will continue. You can't win. So it got to the point where the Ministry of Justice was contacted. Even those who are repenting, there are processes and procedures. Mm. You can't just say, oh, I'm no more fighting. I've dropped my weapon. You must go through the process. And after the process, yes, leniency at the end of the day. But everybody must be seen to have gone through mm. one process or the other. And that builds trust. Because if the society don't trust in, in whatever you're doing, you're wasting your time. Okay. Back to the phones now. Stanley is calling in from Joss. Hello, Stanley. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you. Sir? Go ahead. Go on. Okay. Um, I have a question to Professor Ken. If you... Right. Um, I've um, learned about some of the uh, projections uh, he's, he has put forward. I want to know, of which I have heard him say many occasions that we have wonderful plans, but we are poor in implementation. Now, can 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 I, I want to relate with this discussion and see? These projections, in terms of verifiable impact indicators, that can be explained at, at the macro level, micro level, if there are explanations to some of these projections, and it can be seen at the family level, reduced to family levels, what do we need to see happen at the family level in terms of employment, in terms of poverty reduction. I think that will, it will okay, common man will help to understand how we are moving forward. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Straightforward. Professor Kenifi, your call. If you look at the new national development plan, of which 2021 is the first leg, and is going to 2025. There are six pillars there. Uh, the first pillar is about economic development, which deals with diversification, industrial development, and all that area. The second pillar deals with infrastructure, and I have talked on infrastructure substantially, except if you want me to roll out more figures for you. Then you have the area that deals with public administration, where government is fighting tooth and nail to using all available acts to ensure that there is more transparency, more accountability, more prudence in the management of public finance. And then also, as you can see, some of the finance acts that are constantly you know, shaping and reforming and reforming, uh, which is very, very remarkable. Then there is, there is an area that this is social development. And that's where I got the, the hope that they will get about about 30 million, 35 million people uh, in employment by 2025. Now, we can drill down on those figures because there are particular programs of action on the housing development, on the works, on infrastructure. In fact, you saw one of those in the Economic Sustainability Plan. 774,000 young people were employed in, 774, in 774 local government, 1,000 there's going to be an orchestration of that level of public utility uh, investment in public, uh, public works to ensure that more and more hands, and of course an expansion of the social investment fund, all the various elements of job creation there will all be escalated. And that's why we are looking for a huge investment of 350 trillion, uh, that's not a small money, 70 trillion every year. How, how much is government budget? It's just around 15 trillion, but we are talking about five times that government budget in every year to orchestrate. And then there's also lifting 100 million people out of poverty. There's a commitment to do about 35 million of those by, by, by that same time. 21 million into employment by 2025, 35 million people out of poverty, uh, out of extreme poverty. 
by 2025 out of the you know 24 uh, 35 out of 100 so and the 100 is supposed to be over 10 years so the, the taste of that pudding is actually in the eating if you go to the sectoral plan every sector education housing uh, construction and, and uh, I have to tell you this if you look at the GDP figure the current GDP figure you will see that trade has returned to pre-COVID level and it's even exceeded it and then you have construction the growth rate and construction in manufacturing in um, uh, ICT in finance they're all in double digit and they've all exceeded pre-COVID level though that I have a personal concern about the trade because we, we have been launched into trading balance, where, where we, are, we are importing 8 trillion and then exporting 5 trillion, which is only oil uh, and gas, and then a deficit of 3 trillion. So I'm very, very worried about that, uh, because whilst on one hand, India seems to be parity with us, 700 billion, 700 billion, but China, I can't understand why China is dumping 2.44 trillion Naira goods in Nigeria, and we have no response to that. So back to your question yes there are there are programs that are going to deliver those and I, I i have trust on the integrity of these programs because i'm part of it actually i was the chairman of the technical working group of digital economy bioeconomy science technology and innovation and we made sure that we have these targets written into this plan so that there will be no excuse about monitoring them and giving us a regular motor, and, and that has been one significant thing missing in previous plans. So you, you have confidence in the system, but uh, well, we'll look at that um, before we round up, but we have another caller now, uh, Ibrahim from Kaduna. Hello, Ibrahim. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, actually, hello? Yes, go ahead. Hello, Cyril. Good evening, sir. Yes, Ibrahim, go on. We are listening. Go ahead. I'm always uh, watching this program every Tuesday on one on one. Uh, my own is advice. Uh, I'm a graduate from 2009 to this extent. I want to uh, uh, give MPE International an advice. These people that you keep on inviting, interviewing them, they are the major problems in Nigeria. I want you, please, try to get people like us to be included in their needs. People that have confidence like us, so that as you are, interviewing them, having such caliber of persons like me or others, if someone, because we, they can't just be coming here and be speaking English. Everybody. Ibrahim, but this is the opportunity. This is exactly what you're talking so about. That's why you're on the same. air. You've called in now, yeah, so, so go ahead and, and give your own part of, of it. You are part of the program. You have just called in. You have a view. Go ahead and air it. Hello? Ibrahim, are you still there? All right. Yes. That is that is my own advice. Because uh Yeah, but Ibrahim eleven years from now. Okay, thank you, Ibrahim. But let me just quickly remind you that you have just spoken on this program. So, yeah. you had a whole opportunity. I was waiting to hear you say, right, you do not agree with what the panelists have said. This is what no, you think I the situation is. And we're still waiting. You panelists. can still go ahead. You are part of the program. We have asked you to speak on yes, this program. Adam, exactly what you're saying. Tuesday, if you call them, they <laughs> keep on speaking English without any amendment. Oh, well. Uh, thank you very much, Ibrahim. It would seem as if... Um, uh, to see. You're not it's ready right, to right air those views people. because you just you just you just had a, you know an opportunity <laughs> given to you. Uh, if you disagree with anything anyone has said, that was your opportunity to say it. <laughs> so um, I like you to think uh, uh, to see it this way. You just like every other person, 
a part of this program. Whether we have invited you to come to the studio or not, the fact is we have opened the lines and we have said, call in, air your views, and you had that opportunity. I know that some other people would be looking to call in and air their views. You've heard some of them say that. So, thank you, Ibrahim. Um, let me just say, go ahead and call again some other time and air your own views. We have another caller now, Stephen, who's calling in from Lagos. Hello, Stephen. Yeah. Hello, Stephen, you're on. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. Yes. Good day, good day, good day, good day, sir. My name is Stephen. I'm coming from Lagos. Oh, okay. I want to talk to you on what the poor say about Lugu taxes. When you be a company more than its affordability, it increases the cost of production. And what are the cost of production? Land, finance. Yes. Now, if you go to a full planet that I have for doctor, like China, people sit now in their team and don't think that you does in Nigeria. You know, they are done with the organization of production of a team in China. You know, 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 the everything is created. Now, on top of this, it's a good talk. Like in Nigeria, we live like in Nigeria. China comes to Nigeria and seek to live. Go back to China and live back to it. And we live in China and go to China and install the battery. And the good ones are their own prices. If my country improves on Nepa, not mostly improves on Nepa. That is the main issue. The hand in Nigeria, we are going to use bread to build and give us battery. Not try to work on this one. But if someone gets meta, if someone gets power, okay. Someone in Nigeria will be strong. The main issue is this. Let all of them be on there. Let all the Borenda Party be on there to solve the issue of power in Nigeria. Once power is solved in Nigeria, we are free from all other issues. That's the best one. The only one is we have a long list of world in Nigeria. So I'm going to be an analysis. He can't much work. He gives so much money. That is the one of the political issues with people in Nigeria. If I sit back in my house, people don't know in the city, people don't know in the city, people don't know in the city, I will do my work. If as a doctor, how much I get to own me in the city? This is what they give them in the house of work. Of, 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 this is how they in the same house of assembly. So, why can I go to work? Why can I engineer work? Because you have made the guilty in person. That is the trouble we have in Nigeria. This is why in the all so much affair, that everybody was in the same person. It won't be so. If you start paying the government 10 million a month, if you start paying those in the house of a red, red, two million a month, they can't come down in Nigeria. They are one of the most clear in person to do. Because they see it not as easy as people to do. Yes. What is it like that is not easy as people to do? There's nothing you can do in the whole world. There's no world that can do in the whole world. There's nothing like that for you. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your contribution. But let's uh, return to uh, the studio now and take up one issue that uh, featured prominently in 2021. And uh, I'm coming to uh, Juri Ngelali on this one. 2021, there was a lot of disquiet uh, speaking about industrial relations. Strikes, uh, talk about strikes and actual strikes. It cut across from education to health to energy. Um, 2021 saw so many strikes. The administration had its hands full negotiating and some of them uh, were said to be the result of um, a failure to carry through agreements in the past. How do you assess this? 
Thank you, Cyril. Um, I think first and foremost to recognize the fact that many of the uh, strike actions uh, that you refer to, uh, most of them were either, rever uh, you know, averted entirely or resolved. Uh, and of course, that is a positive outcome. Uh, I think if you look at the long history of this country, certainly within the ambit of my journalistic career, I have seen several uh, successive strike actions across subsectors of the economy. Uh, that's become kind of a yearly feature in this country, unfortunately. M much of it has to do with the fact that you have very real uh, economic constraints uh, and many of the factors such as a once in a century global pandemic that cut your uh, revenues by 50% at a point uh, come into play and you now still have to, uh, you know, deal with agreements that were struck when there was no such thing as a global pandemic. These are, these are realities, right? So it's about having these discussions and these negotiations uh, and people leveling with each other, not antagonizing each other, not demonizing each other and getting to uh, the, uh, the, the root of issues. I think what's really important though is that all sides require a level of compassion that has not really be, been part of uh, our national uh, culture when it comes to interrelating with ourselves. Compassion in the sense that if we're battling a once in a century pandemic and you know that your hospital is more full than it has ever been in the history of you working in that hospital, and yes, you have your grievances uh, with, with government, etc., through your union or, or whatever the case may be, at some point there should be a, a basic human minimum uh, of what we will or will not do uh, in view of life and death scenarios where you can go on in action, take an action, uh, and it kills an innocent person, for example. So these are some of the areas where I, we, we believe that uh, there can be uh, kind of a, a greater enhancement of some of these virtues that would allow us to uh, roll through some of these difficulties in a better way. With that said, uh, Cyril, I think there are, because several things have been said since the last time I had a chance to speak, and it's really important for me to be able to respond to at least some of them. One is the notion that uh, there's just English being spoken on these programs. Oftentimes, uh, I spend a lot of time uh, going out and engaging with Nigerians, not just on the street, but on TV and radio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And oftentimes what they say is that government does not communicate enough. But ironically, uh, when you attempt to reach out and communicate sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, uh, people will, uh, you know, say that you're just shooting grammar, when in fact you are communicating based on empirical evidence that you can prove and verify. So, for example, uh, if we begin to talk about how we unlock private capital uh, to supplement uh, public sector investment uh, in the case of the National Development Plan. We're not talking about some pie in the sky, in the clouds plan that we aspire to but we're not able to reach. No, we're saying that we're going to double down on what you have already seen us accomplish. What do I mean by that? When we say we're unlocking private capital, you can look at uh, President Muhammadu Buhari's Executive Order 007, which is the Road Refurbishment Tax Credit Scheme, uh, in which we've been able to get private companies to put up their capital to reconstruct or newly construct federal highways in exchange for calibrated tax relief. Uh, you have Boni Bodo Road right now in River State, 109, uh, 199 billion Naira uh, Road, linking NLNG on Bi Boni Island with the mainland of this country for the first time in history, that is being paid up front by NLNG and then uh, repaid uh, by, by government through tal calibrated tax relief. Uh, we have the same thing going on on the Apapa Oron Shoki Tollgate Road. Anybody that has plied that road over the course of the last uh, few years would know that what I'm saying right now is not grammar but an empirical reality that they experience every day in terms of uh, the, the infrastructure developing around the ports. See, so whether it's that or whether it's the Presidential Infrastructure Development Fund, PIDF, where we're building the 336 billion Naira Second Niger Bridge, start to complete. It's going to Okay. Okay, so that's a glitch on that audio. We'll, we'll fix that as we go on. But, uh, um, okay.
Let's see if we can link up straight Interest with is making uh, sure that okay, Nigerians fine. know exactly what we're doing and those things that we're not able to do, why we're not able to do them. Because there's a limit to what you can do when you have real economic constraints, a once in a century global pandemic, historically uh, low oil prices as of 2020 when it cut down to about $13 per barrel. These are realities that must be communicated even as uh, we, we continue to engage moving forward. Now, uh, let's link up with uh, Professor Kabir Mato. In just a couple of days, 2021 will be done, and uh, we're all looking forward to 2022. Prof, what are your expectations of the coming year? Well, I, I expect that, uh, you know, 2022 is going to be uh, a year of a lot of uh, politicking. Uh, what uh, really remains uncertain is whether the Nigerian currency, Naira, will continue to be so unprotected uh, to the extent that it will continue to lose its value, uh, you know, put in comparison with the, with the, with the American dollar. Uh, if that is done and we see a further shrink in the value of our local currency, then of course that will also spill a lot of economic doom to uh, you know, the purchasing power of uh, several Nigerians. Uh, you know, we have heard and uh, some of us are attuned with the fact that there may be the need to deregulate the uh, you know, subsidy on, I mean, uh, to remove the subsidy on petroleum products. Uh, you know, a very painful decision, which I think it's uh, very critical, if really uh, some sufficient resources is to be liberated for further, uh, you know, economic development of the rest of the Nigerian society as against uh, a current tradition of uh, subsidizing a very minute fraction of the population, uh, uh, you know, who unfortunately or fortunately are so strong and up the societal ladder to the extent that they can uh, always voice out their opposition to any genuine and patriotic move on the part of government uh, to uh, bring a meaningful life to the majority of the citizenry. So those who are holding the economy by the juggler will continue to do uh, what they are used to doing. Uh, it's left for government now to try to uh, come up with efficient strategies, especially protecting the local currency, that is the Naira. You know, in the face of this vicious, uh, you know, international attack that it receives on a minute by minute basis. Today, it's over 500 naira to a yuan American dollar. This is uh, unbecoming. In 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 the last, uh, you know, many years in the 1970s, in the 1980s, and 1990s, uh, when they tell us about. Uh, you know, the value of the currency in our neighboring countries, uh, mainly francophone, uh, we were amazed. We laughed over it. Today, the value of the Naira is not any radically different from what you have in these countries. And I think it's uh, uh, obviously not necessarily uh, a structurally economic issue, but it's also the policy dimension of it that has to be done. Now, i give you an example. Uh, between 1993 to 1990. Uh, it when General Bacha held forth. The value of the Naira to the dollar remained constant at 86 Naira. Uh, you know, it means that government could actually intervene and decide to fix a price uh, for its own currency. But the, the, the problem is that those who hold yeah, you know, the foreign denominations in large quantity are up there at the societal ladder and will do anything to frustrate that. Nigeria has, you know, the largest number of uh, brood change in the continent of Africa. And even uh, in Europe, you hardly can find a country that has so many, uh, which means the Naira is exposed. And as long as the Naira is so exposed and its value continues to dilapidate, what it means is that even if we buy petrol in January at the cost of 370 Naira to a litre, uh, you know, it will only be for a small period of time when again uh, there will be need for either subsidy or again a further deregulation. So one, I'm saying that we need to fix that certainly if we want to start getting things done, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a manner that will be helpful to the Nigerian society in 2022. Uh, politics, that is the year of politics. Uh, 
PDP has started, like I said, they have their national executive committee. They are going into their states in the APC is coming up in February. And, uh, you know, a lot of other smaller political parties, because Nigeria is predominantly a two-party state. Yes, Afghan in a number of states. But substantially, if you divide 36 by that number, you will find that really it's, it's a two-party state. So political actors will be desperate. They will come with all manners of scheming in order to either retain political relevance or secure political acceptability on the part of the citizen. And I think this must be done with high degree of caution. And like somebody said in the course of this program, the bottom line should be Nigeria and not you know, uh, the political party that provides the lead in this country. If we put that behind our minds, then of course we'll be able to you know, have our words bound on the understanding of what democracy is, that is, the majority to have its way. Okay. All right, th thanks for that. And uh, um, we'll qu quickly go to Professor Kenny Fay and say, well, at the end of the day, I suppose all that matters is if the citizens can say the quality of life has improved, uh, they've got more money in their pockets, or perhaps uh, the money in their pockets now uh, can purchase them what they need uh, much better than 2021. Are we projected or looking at that in 2022 when uh, the citizen can say, my life is better? Well, I think I'd like to tackle what uh, Professor Kadir has mentioned about uh, foreign exchange and all of that. You see, there, there is a fundamental mismatch between the request for Forex and what we get as income from Forex. You know, there's a mismatch. And until you are in a position where you are exporting more than what you are importing, then, then you have that comfort. At the moment, we're not. Let me give you some example. We're only exporting oil and gas to the extent that 80% of our forex comes from that export activity. Now, other productive factors, other productive forces like manufacturing of agricultural products, assembling of products and re-exporting, they are not bringing enough currency to ensure that we can deal with the appetite for the import. Because at the moment, CBN gets NMPC is supposed to be sending $3 billion every month to CBN, their proceeds, which eventually finds its way to our external reserves. They have not received anything for the whole of this year. So for 12 months now, CBN has not received that, those monies. And yet you expect CBN to go and start printing American dollar in our minting house. That's, that's not going to happen. So we, the only way it gets the money it gets is maybe something from remittance and then borrowed money because you go, we cannot afford to allow the debt to crystallize. We have debts that are denominated in dollars. And we have to find currency to pay for those every month as we are, we are servicing our debts. And then, of course, there are invincibles and then you have the manufacturing sector taking a lot of it. 80% of the manufacturing capacity in Nigeria are dependent on imported raw materials. So you can now understand why CBN now moved for 100 for 100 program, which allows you up to 5 billion. Um, and then 50% of it minimum must be raw material from Nigeria. 80% of workers must be from Nigeria. So they are now trying to create a new industrial structure. Rather than fight and fight existing old structure, they want to create new structure. The that shift in 2022. Are we going to see a shift in 2022? Are we going to see a shift in 2022? Prof, if you can hear me, I'm saying, are we going to see a shift in 2022? There are so many game changers that are taking place right now that will make 2022 much, much more confident. We are going to be much more confident about the future. Okay, you see the Inara. Now, let me tell you the impact of e Naira. e Naira plays on, on settlement of, for international trade to some extent. It will also help bring in many millions. Remember, 40% of our population are not even in the banking sector. It's going to bring all that guys all into the, into the banking. And let me tell you that there's a study that I just had results of yesterday, today. 
Nigeria is ranked number six in the world in real time uh, uh, transactions. Who is number one? India, 25 billion transactions. You know, this financial trans Number two is China. Come down Korea, Nigeria is number six. We are even ahead of uh, America. So, and then many other countries, we are number six. Now, what it shows you, by the time you add the impact of e naira, the impact of all these cashless things, Nigeria is, is moving. We are moving with a tremendous pace. So, digital inclusion is one, one where the digital, and this is all because of the infrastructure that we have, this, uh, we've been investing in, payment infrastructure. And that is why, you know that because of this, during COVID last year, our banking sector were posting double-digit growth while there was a shutdown. It's because substantial investment has gone into payment infrastructure. You have USSD, you have uh, POS, you have all kinds of infrastructure, and it's opening up the space. And then secondly, there are 90 million MSMEs in Africa. 42 million of them are from Nigeria. How can we be 47% of the businesses in Africa when we're only 80% of the population and 80% of the GDP? It shows you that entrepreneurship is growing phenomenally in Nigeria and, and is a, a latent political advantage. In terms of the inflation, the trends are going to be coming down. The heat is coming down on inflation, and then we're going to see more of that. And of course, we benefited from, uh, the, we didn't get flooding this year, so food, the yield was, was reasonable. And then, of course, we also see other areas like uh, investment. You've seen the figures we're expecting in investment and the, the superstructures and the in, uh, companies that have been set up, world-class companies, world-class asset management company, world-class infrastructure company, bringing private sector head on to deal with all these investments. While politicians are playing their politics, you're going to see private sector get heavily involved in driving our economy. So things are looking up. It's not as bad. It's not as bad. And I think we, one thing where we are not doing correctly is we are not giving enough credit to the state actors that are actually changing the game. I'm talking about the vice president and his um, uh, doing business indicator and all the moving, moving us forward in that area. And then technology. Tech, Nigeria has the highest tech hubs in Africa. Well, we're, we're fast running out of time, and so uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to move on. And uh, let's 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 come to general and say, we have, what do you expect to see in 2022? Safer country? If the level of <coughs> excuse me, coordination, cooperation, and collaboration continues, right, it's going to be better uh, because a lot of people are, are coming out. So much I've been discussed. Somebody says so much grammar. Yes, people have been talking. But if you don't understand that you have a problem, then the problem is multi. But everybody has come around to understand that we have problems. How do we address these problems? Two weeks ago, the uh, National Orientation Agency organized a seminar. Apart from so many other ones, everybody had been organizing. And a lot of issues came up. Civil society organizations, you can't look at yourself and say you are in the opposition. You, most of you are Nigerians. So if the country is not safe, how do you go about to do whatever you need to do? So everybody had, people are coming up. And then Minister of Education have been told, look, let us go back to the basics. Security, awareness, and education should start from primary school. Let's learn from what the Swedish did in 2011. Let us take it to the family, orientation agency, Ministry of Information. Let people start being security conscious and aware of what is happening around them. You can't afford to wait until somebody comes in. We build trust. Based on trust, more trust, more confidence in the system, things get better. People will not be able to meet and talk to maybe a policeman or a military man and say, I have seen something happening here, and somebody reacts. Above all, community policing, the police have been challenged. We go back to the drawing board and look at community policing, especially in the rural areas where you don't have enough policemen. Let's, let's use traditional rulers, leaders of opinions, people within the area. Let them come around and people have a way of securing the environment. Let us go back to the drawing board. We can't be, you can't be copying somebody without taking your own culture into consideration. Our cultures differ. So mm. you can't be like Americans. They have a system, they have a way of life. We have our own way of life. Let us go back to what we are and gradually you build from bottom up and then let's communicate both ways. He, uh, the other person was talking about 
communication, trying to communicate. The problem is, when you keep quiet for so long, when you come out to want to talk to people, it's like, what are you telling me? So the government too has been challenged. You need to communicate more frequently. Don't right. depend on just one person. You have a meeting, let people be aware. Take example for what is happening in US or UK. The president comes out and talk. This is what you've agreed upon. Somebody, a spokesman is appointed. This is what we're doing, this is what we're doing. Okay. Interministerial committees, let them meet regularly and tell the citizens of what is happening. All right, thank you so much. And as I always say on this program, no one single program can take care of all the issues at stake. Uh, it's a time to start up the conversation and uh, at, a t at some point in time we'll leave the conversation and hope to pick it up um, uh, another day from a different angle. So, um, well, we've, 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 we've done almost an hour, to, uh, two hours talking about these issues. And um, in just some 48 hours, it will be 2022. This exactly is the last edition of NTA Tuesday Live for the year 2021. When next we meet on this platform, it will be talking about what's happening in the new year, which will be 2022. And I'd just like to take out some time here and say, look, for all those who have been part of this program, we appreciate you. We thank you for being part of it. But for tonight, let us say a big thank you to our guests who have come in here. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your being here. And uh, we hope you come again and discuss these issues in greater detail. Thank you so much. Uh, Major General Gerba Wahab, Director General, Amir Resource Center, Abuja. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you for right. inviting me. Ajuri Ingalali, Senior Special Assistant to the President. You've, you've been always talking about uh, the public and those who are in the administration, we appreciate you for coming on this program, my jury. Thank you for coming. And uh, to Professor Kenny Fay, development economist, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, Nigerians will say, well, we look forward to a great 2022 uh, where we can have more money and uh, a bigger purchase in power in our pockets. Thank you, Prof. For having me. And uh, Professor Kabir Batu, who joined us from our Kaduna Network Center. Prof, it's always a delight to have you join these conversations. And uh, Nigerians will be looking out for all the politicking in 2022. Thank you for being on this program. Thank you very much, Cyril. Thank you very much, and good night. And also, Good night. thank you too for all those who are part of this program tonight. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, next week, next year, we'll be back with NTA Tuesday Live. Uh, from me, Cyril Stover, I say, well, get that double vaccination and be boosted. And uh, we'll see you around next year. Bye now.